So we'll start right away with uh, Professor Ganesh Stock. From, Professor Ganesh is from the Institute of Plasma Research and he'll be talking about data intense computational plasma physics. Okay, so um, this is going to be a totally different uh, set of presentations, okay? There's not much of AI, ML, data science discussion there. This talk is to let people sensitize about tremendous opportunity waiting there. And uh, I would like to see if some, I can impress at least 1% of this audience that there is actually something exciting happening in one part of the world, which is within India. So uh, I work at the Institute for Plasma Research, which is uh, funded by DAE, Department of Atomic Energy. And um, most of the work is in computer simulations. And I also dabble with experiments once in a while. Okay? So I'm, since the audience are very sort of diverse, or at least they were diverse yesterday, um, uh, I, I thought that I'll just make a run through very quickly about what's happening and how you guys can sort of chip in as, as time goes on. Okay? So what really drives plasma science at IPR? And uh, I'll run through some background issues for, because most of you probably are not aware of what's going on. And then tell you about one or two computer simulation example, probably one, because uh, Kashyap is very strict on time today. And uh, then I want to also discuss how this community can sort of participate, and then with some outlooks. Okay? And you can stop me if you want. Uh, we can always discuss it later as well. So what drives plasma science at IPR? So most of you prof sort of know that how sun works, uh, and the fusion runs it, and the fusion process through which it works is a very high energy process. Uh, it sort of it requires about 100 million Kelvin for the process to uh, happen, and neutrons come out of it. It heats it, heats it up, etc. But the densities here are extraordinary. The densities are 100 times more than the density of copper in the core of the sun. So it's impossible to set up such experiments in Earth because of the density being very high. So the question is, are there processes which are happening at maybe at a higher temperature? but can work at lower densities, because it's much easier to confine plasma, as I'll let you know in a minute, at lower densities. The answer is yes. Uh, there are processes which sort of, uh, here this is called a hydrogen cycle. And there are processes called deuterium cycle. Deuterium is a heavier hydrogen. And tritium is a heavier hydrogen than the de deuterium. And these two, they too can fuse and produce some neutrons. And this is a process which can happen at very high temperature, at about 150 million degree Kelvin as compared, to, as compared to 100 million in sun and can happen at incredibly low densities. Okay? The question is, can we sort of use this? So why do you want to actually look at this process? Because we actually need energy sources as the statistics says. This is a global statistics. It says that as the time increases, we're going to use more and more electricity. And right now we are here somewhere around 2020. And Indian number is here on the right-hand side, which is I picked up from the Central Electricity Authority, as a number estimate, which actually says that we are at 0.365 terawatt. There's a terawatt here in the axis. So we, we are way down here. And the world is going to go that fast. And we are going to, because of a population, we're going to rise even faster than that. So energy demands are going to be crazy. And we don't have much of a breakup here. We can see that we are already using up thermal, renewable, as well as hydro. And we are left with nuclear options. So I don't want to talk about nuclear fission. We are already doing a lot of it. So let's talk about nuclear fusion. The question is, that's the main focus of what drives science at IPR. Can we make processes happen on Earth in a controlled manner? And it's a thermal equilibrium, but it can create nuclear fusion. So it's a thermonuclear fusion processes. Thermal means less of free energy. Nuclear means nuclear which fuses energies at, at about 150 million degree Kelvin at a density which is uh, one millionth of air density as against in sun, which is 100 times the copper density. So naturally, it is much low density, but high temperature processes. So can we get this thing going? That's the question. But the question is, what are the resources? As we saw in the previous slide, you need, a, you need a deuterium and you need a tritium. And tritium is not really available much directly, but we have deuterium available in water, and we also have, can, can convert uh, from the process a deuterium in, through a lithium-6 process, we can create tritium also. So tritium and deuterium effectively are available 
so that this, this process can go on and we, if we can get a plasma going at 150 million degrees and put this deuterium and tritium there and hold it for a long enough time, then probably we can get the fusion process going. All right, so this is the process which is driving. So what do, what do we do? How does the whole thing happen for people who sort of not sure how plasma works? So you can confine plasma, meaning ionized electrons and ions, through what we apply as magnetic field. The problem with this is that it can confine it radially out across the magnetic field, but it's very hard to hold it along. That's how electromagnetism works, unfortunately. Therefore, what people normally do is try to make the magnetic field more dense on the sides and make a mirror machine out of it, so, there are, so that it'll have tough time going out, but still the particles escape. One simple way is to turn this whole thing around and make it endless, so that if it escapes from here, it sort of comes from this side. So can one make this whole thing endless? Yes, of course. So then you can get, for example, go to the, rot, the top right-hand side device. So you, can, you could have turned this device around, this device around, and you could have produced a device like this, which sort of is endless now. So the particles would not escape along, the particles would not escape across, and you stay there forever. And then you can now start heating it if you want. The trouble is that electromagnetism says that once you turn the magnetic field around here, then it imposes a magnetic field gradient in the radial direction. Therefore, there are other issues that come in. So you need to have, instead of a simple circular field, you need to have a helical field to go around. So to get the helical field, you also have to pass current. So there are several configurations people have played around with across the world. So one is called, on the left, is called a tokamak, which was first discovered in the USSR, in, uh, in the erstwhile USSR, in the 1950s. The second one is called a stellarator. This has plasma and a current in it, so that the net magnetic field is helical. And it's very complex. You have a toroidal magnetic field generation structure, etc. And this is even more complex than this, where the magnetic field itself is produced by external coils. And it looks like one of those dinosaurs' bones, very complex in this character. So today, we're going to sort of spend more time on this device. So this is now considered as one of the most uh, sort of happening devices in nuclear fusion. So how does the device look like from inside? So this device looked like a toroidal donut. You can see a guy standing here. And the, the coils, et cetera, are outside. So if you now start a plasma on this, the plasma would look like this, very hot in the center. And because it touches the surface, it recombines and radiates, so it's very cold on the surface. So you produce a sort of a plasma here. And the plasma is incredibly hot, in this case, at about 100 million Kelvin. The question is, do we have it in India? Yes. We, are, we started this problem way back in the 1986. These are our two tokamaks that we have in IPR, Institute for Plasma Research. So one is on the left. Somewhere inside this, in the jungle is a toroidal device, and there is a plasma. And on the, on the right, we have something called a superconducting steady state toroidal device. This works on uh, superconducting magnetic fields. The densities are uh, sort of very thin, like I said, a millionth of an air or less. But the temperatures are, as of now, are 3 to 5 million degree Kelvin. So we are able to heat the plasma, but hold it only for a short while. So how long should we hold it is the next question. So how do you know that there is a plasma here? You can plug in a lot of diagnostics from various sites. And these diagnostics measure various things. For example, the first two diagnostics measure the probes, the, the magnetic field. The second one measures the density. You can have a whole lot of diagnostics. And these diagnostics produce immense amount of data. Okay? And these data are correlated. More than one diagnostic produces the same, uh, measures the same physical quantity. So you could probably have a, you know, a Bayesian-like comparison. But so this is a toroidal device, and there are a lot of diagnostics plugged into it. And the hot plasma is inside this device. The magnetic field is in the toroidal direction. And you can sort of diagnose the whole thing. So you could probably do a lot of analysis to cross-check the data. So how does the whole plasma start off? So you start with a neutral gas and you produce a mechanism like a, like a transformer, produce a toroidal electric field. It breaks the neutral gas into electrons and ions. The magnetic field holds it. And it passes large amount of current. You can, you can have a huge amount of current passing through it. So when you suddenly, it goes on only for about 0.7 seconds. So when you stop the device, all the energy goes and hits the wall. So you cannot stop the real, real devices in a very rap, in, a, in a disruptive manner. You have to do it in a very slow process. Okay? 
Okay, so this is these are the experimental data coming from uh, IPR, IPR's devices. One is on Aditya and the other one is on this. So uh, basically they measure how the, temp uh, the, the, the current goes up, uh, how the plasma is sustaining, what are the oscillations in the plasma, etc. So uh, Lawson in the way in the 60s, a chap called Lawson found that the uh, triple product of density, temperature and plasma lifetime has to be about 10 power 21 to, for the particles to fuse. So this basically implies that you can control the density. Density is only a millionth of a uh, millionth of a air density. Temperature is, can only be 150 million degrees. It cannot be more than that. So what can you change is plasma lifetime. And it was discovered that the plasma lifetime basically scales with the machine size. The bigger the machine, the plasma stays there for longer for some reasons which I probably I can't discuss right here. But take my word that it, it sort of stays longer. So the raise is you need to build bigger and bigger machines and see we can satisfy the Lawson criteria which says that for a given density and temperature which is at a millionth of an air temp density 100, 150 million degrees here you have to increase the plasma lifetime which scales with the size so we need to go to so how do you know this is really happening because if you now plot this triple product which is called n times t times the lifetime of the plasma as a function of temperature, in, it, it got cut here, it's a temperature in, uh, in, in millions of degrees, then you can see that systematically uh, sort of it is increasing. So you, you probably many of you wouldn't know that there are about more than 150 tokamaks working in the world and a few stellarators. And if you, this data is extracted from these, uh, these devices, and you can see that the Lawson criteria is get, has been completely, we are able to almost go there. This green line is the line where you would put as much, if you put some amount of energy and produce fusion, you will almost get as much energy back, which is called a break even. That's this green line. And if you push it further in temperature or density, then you would get enough energy that the plasma will self ignite itself and start sustaining there. The thermonuclear process will work and it will start throwing neutrons, which you can use to produce electricity. So, how do you do this? So, from here, you have to go further up. So we are somewhere, uh, somewhere here now. Already, already in, in 1991, for example, in a tokamak called JET, about 16 megawatt of fusion power has already been produced as a proof of principle for this information. Now the question is, can I go to a bigger machine? So presently, there is a huge effort called International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is called ITER, which is being built in France. And India is one of the participants in this machine. And uh, the machine is worth 22 billion US dollars and counting because it keeps sort of increasing every minute. And seven nations are participating in it. India is one of them. And uh, this machine is being built in a place in France called Cadarache, which is in southern France and on the, on the, uh, close to the water. And this is a humongous device. I don't know whether you can see, there is a small red guy here standing who is on the human, human scale, on the scale of this device. The size of this is about 30 meters in size. It's a concrete jungle. It's being built, as we're speaking, now in France. So this is being built in Kadarash in southern France. It's one of India's mega science projects. And it has already been approved. Government of India has sanctioned about 100 and, what is this number? 1,500 crore rupees has already been sanctioned. And it has to be spent, uh, 15, uh, whatever that number is, it's correct. I don't know how to say that. It's too big for my ordinary mortal uh, the numbers. And this has already been sanctioned. Uh, it, is, uh, it is about uh, one and a half, two billion US dollars, I think. And this uh, is to be spent before 2025. Okay. And we already chipped in. India is making the cryostat and it has been delivered. And all the other components are different countries are making. The number of countries are US, European Union, Russia, China, India, Korea, and Japan. So India has chipped in already its, its material, it's putting in cryostats and various other particulars. Every country is paying in cash and kind, depending on their economy and how things go. So this is what is the situation as of now. So this is the actual site where it is being built in Kadarash. There's a typo here. There should be an H. French guys put H and E and everything everywhere. So, so uh, there is a, this is a place in southern France. And this is the actual size. When I visited it last year or a year before, it was stunning. It was like unbelievable, the scale of the problem, but it's fun. So now, where are we? How does this community sort of come into the picture? Okay. This community meaning I'm, uh, ML, AI, data science guys with your algorithms and your capabilities to handle big data 
and try and see some sense out of as complex stuff as you know, financial markets and game theory and whatnot. I mean, it is. Okay, so the inside the device, if you open up and see, you will see that the tokamak has a cross section like this, the plasma has a cross section like this. And the central temperature is about 150 million degrees, and the outside temperature is about 0.1 million or less than that on, on the surface. So this is a, across few meters. In the eater, eater device that we talked about is about, the cross section of this is about few meters, about two meters, and the major radius, which we call as the size of the vada, the radial size of the vada is about six meters. So if you, if you now think of that as a cross section here, this is at about 115 million, and this is about 0.1 million Kelvin, and that gradient is enormous, and lots of processes happen simultaneously, what one needs to understand. And the process is inherently multi-scale. For example, if some of you remember, when you put in uh, electrons and ions in a magnetic field, they sort of make a circuitous motion. So the distance to which they can excurt around a magnetic field is called a Raman radius. So you can see that several scales are connected. The electron scales and ion scales are plotted here. In inverse scales are plotted. So there are several processes happening at the ion scale, at the electron scale as well as the ion scale, and they are all talking to each other. It's a fully nonlinear driven dissipative system at incredibly hot temperatures and low densities. Okay, so, so, yeah, three I'll, I'll try to push, I'll try to push. Right, sure, sure. Yeah. Right, so, uh, I was hoping that you'd be kind enough, let's see how yeah, it goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the, the thing is this, this is really a multi-scale problem, really inherently multi-scale problem. And several processes uh, run up to this. Remember that the aim of the device is to produce steady state electricities. Right? which basically means it's going to run forever. Or when you're going to shut down, you're going to get in megajoules of energy being shut down carefully, so you would know all the processes that you need to require. Therefore, to understand this, naturally I can't do a linear calculation and do simple things. You need high-performance computing. It is an absolute necessity for fusion plasma science. There's no way out. So the question is, what are the, what are the issues right now? How are we tackling? So previously, when they were doing simpler calculations in a circular plasma, gigaflops and giga, uh, and small size computing was enough. As you go up in complexity and eventually end up in ETA, we may have to go beyond petaflops to exascale and beyond. Like uh, you know, Professor Balakrishna yesterday suggested, we really are, have to push ourselves way beyond to go to exascale computing here. So wh where, are, what, where are we now in, in the scale? So at IPR, we have recently bought a one petaflop machine which has started working since September, and it has been working as usual, nonstop. We have a data center, and, uh, and it can perform about 10 power 15 calculations per second. So in Sanskrit, it's called Antya. Uh, so we called it Antya. So this machine is working. I will not get into the details. And when you visit IPR, you can see that it is a very well done system. So the question is, uh, how are you going to put this to use? Already people are using it. At, at IPR, we have a large number of scientists and PhD students. And there are a whole lot of host of computer simulation calculations happen. For example, we use molecular dynamic studies to understand plasma wall interface, which is at about 0.1 million Kelvin in the, in the tokamak. We do particle in-cell simulations for both devices as well as for tokamaks. We also do Monte Carlo simulations on the edge because there are a lot of neutrals there which randomly kick in. And we also do something called Maxwell, uh, Vlasso-Maxwell simulations, magnetohydrodynamic simulations. We also do hybrid simulations. We, we apply many of these to a lot of fundamental processes also, like in astroplasmas and for understanding. So uh, here is an example which I would like to sort of project. Just to show you the size of the data, this is a simple one-dimensional calculation. Uh, so you imagine that you're going around this torus, around the torus, and not bothered about anything else. You're just going around the torus along the magnetic field line. So the magnetic field line won't be visible for you because it doesn't confine along the di direction of the magnetic field. So if I do a full kinetic simulation in just along the direction of the magnetic field, you actually have much more complex problem to tackle. So here is an example of that. If you just do a simple-minded calculation along the magnetic field and use certain grid sizes and resolve electrons and ions, you get enormous amount of data. A huge amount of data. The question is, this is a part of a PhD work from one of the students. The question is, apart from some simple stuff like you know global conservation of energy and momentum, most of the data is unexplored. Okay, it's pretty rich and synthetic. I don't know how it runs here. Let me check. 
Okay, so it, it sort of works. So this is a phase space plot of velocity along the, of the particles along the field line as the particles move in, and this is the position of the particle. And uh, what we have done is to solve what is called as a Vlasov-Maxwell equation along the magnetic field, and outside the board, what is plotted is the phase space density of the particles. Okay, so as 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 uh, this the simulation shows how a nonlinear process sets in and how multiple scales set in, even for a simple one-dimensional problem along the toroidal magnetic field. The actual problem is much more crazier. So we have uh, actual fusion plasma going into a five-dimensional problem at the least. Okay, With time, it becomes six. You have to resolve electron and ion scales. You have to consider magnetohydrodynamics in the system. And there are regions within the plasma which require all kinds of hybrid models. You have heating effects which are coming because you want to keep the plasma at 150 million degrees. And then you have neutrons coming out of it, alpha particles coming out of it, so you have magnetic geometry. So you need a new approach to handle these tons of correlated data, which is Bayesian-like, and making sense to make it integrated tokamak modeling. So steady state, you have to be steady state friendly because you want to do calculations for a long time. You need to do plasma control, and you have to make sure that the plasma with millions of joules doesn't just disrupt, it has to be. So you need a control system. In this system. So challenging new opportunities for this community exist. So but how do you shake hand between these two communities? So how would you and we come together? Okay. So there is a nice platform, which some of you may know. So we have a platform called Board of Studies in Research in Nuclear Science, BRNS. In that, there is a special subcell called Plaza Plasma Fusion Research Council. This council is, so if you make a, how does it work? sort of is a sub council or a sub committee within this BRNS. So what you need to do is to submit a project which requires a project coordinator from IPR, for example, and you are the PI. So there's a PC and a PI. And then you define a problem which is to be connected to plasma science, predominantly tokamaks, but people cook up, you know, you can connect up anything to anything in principle. And then you can have workshops conducted at IPR. So how do you know what the problems are? IPR conducts workshops on and off on what are the major issues it's now handling what kind of things that are happening. So you could sort part of participate that. And then you could contribute through the understanding that you have in your community in terms of AI, ML, and big data handling. We have HPC. And the institute allows people to use HPC, provided it comes under a BRNS project, because it's connected to this. Okay. So just to show you, the 2017 data, a little old. Through this BRNS project, we have disseminated about you know, 52 crore rupees in the last several years, and there is absolutely no contribution from anybody from this community. Zero. Okay. So you can see that uh, people have come from all industry projects have come. There are material science guys coming in, medical applications, RF. Everybody comes in, but nobody from here. But we have tons and tons of data. Okay. So that's the outlook. So I believe that tokamaks and thermonuclear fusion are essential for this country. This is my take. People may differ, of course. India is a partner to ITER, which is expected to produce its first plasma in 2025. Magnetic confinement fusion, though appears elusive, because we've been talking about it from 1950s and 60s, is one of the most optimistic routes to thermonuclear fusion. And it's very multifaceted. It's sort of complex experiments, theory, HPC simulations, material science, technology, and money involved. So I strongly believe that this community's participation would help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, so we'll defer questions for later. Maybe one question? Any questions, people? Um, how do you handle this much of you know, the temperatures you're talking about, millions of Kelvin? So what material, uh, or is there any way you handle this? Uh, yeah, so uh, luckily what happens is uh, there is a magnetic field. So the magnetic field holds uh, most of the charged particles, but they can't travel radially out, meaning perpendicular to the magnetic field, the motion is stopped because of electromagnetism. So you can heat it up very rapidly. But in the parallel direction, it will run away because magnetic field doesn't hold in the direction parallel to itself. So in that direction, to stop it, we sort of turn the magnetic field around, so it becomes a donut. So across the magnetic field, it's held by magnetic field. Along, it's held because of geometry. The geometry introduces complexities, but that we have to manage because that's the only way out. Otherwise, it's like you said, the very hot material will 
will touch the surface. So you have to be very careful how it goes and touches the material. And there are special geometry which holds, even it touches, even the wall is about 0.1 million Kelvin. So when it touches, you don't let it touch at all points. There are structures called diverters, which is kept on the wall. And then that takes it out, there's a sort of smooth exit, and it sucks out the hot plasma out of the device. There is one more question there. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, so following up on the same question, uh, you have said that using the uh, toroidal field, you are confining the plasma. But, uh, so I, I'm unsure about this, but from what I have read, there are always, uh, due to the inherent particulate nature of the plasma, there are always uh, going to be some thermal fluxes which are uh, going to sort of uh, protrude out of this uh, confinement and that damages the wall. So, what are the efforts that we take in order to uh, take care of such kind of randomized uh, fluxes? That's right. So that, that actually that question has two parts. So allow me to split it into two parts. So there is a plasma which touches the wall. And uh, in here it touches the wall everywhere. So what we do is to change the shape so that it is allowed to touch only at one par par corner, which is called a diverter. So when it touches it, what you said is right. It sort of really affects the, the plasma properties. And the surface wall gets damaged. So we use uh, careful tailoring of magnetic field and also tungsten material and we need to sort of often replace it. One of the important things that I sort of didn't come up in the discussion is that when you actually put deuterium and tritium in the actual plasma, right now the plasmas that we produce are all simple hydrogen plasmas, argon plasmas, but the actual plasma should be deuterium and tritium which produces neutrons. The neutrons will activate all the surfaces inside the tokamak. So you cannot really handle anything from by going and touching anything. So everything has to be remote handled. So you, do, you need to have remote handling, and remote handling is completely AI dominated. So right now, India is participating big time in figuring out how do you do remote handling. There are robotics, remote handling, and big data all already working on projects through to handle this kind of question. Suppose a tile gets damaged, and you are in a neutronic environment, you need to have a robotic arm to exactly know where it is. So you need to have ML there. You have to simulate the whole device in a machine make it trainable and make sure that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the two devices. So that when you do it here on the thing, the robotic arm actually picks up the tile and it actually does fixing of the tiles, broken tiles. This has already been demonstrated by some other country, but India is lacking it, so we are still working on it. Thank you, Professor Ganesh, again. Okay.